Hey guys, welcome to the show. I got to tell you that intro, uh, not Jay, it's, it's grown on me, man. I'm just sitting here dancing to it in my seat. <laughs> Thanks again for doing that. Yeah, you're welcome. Hey, let me give you guys a quick update. You know, as of July 1st, the Postcards from the Front card jam is open and we have 11 people who have signed up and we have two games already submitted myself with my Rick Toffin game and Richard with his toot toot, which if you got a chance to see us last weekend, we play tested and Oh my God, that was a lot of fun. So we're off to a good start. Um, you've got four months or something like that. So uh, if you're just hearing about this, tonight, I'm sorry. It goes until when October 31st. Boogie that boogeyman's gonna come out. So then. yeah, all of July, August, September. Yeah, four months. Yeah. Let's see. What does it say right now? It says three months, twenty-six days, five hours, and fifty-nine minutes. Not enough time. <laughs> hey, the good news is the following day, postcards from the front, Christmas cards opens for your guys' submissions as well. So I think so, I think we got a rhythm to keep this going twenty you know three sixty five. You uh, if you look in your email, you have the cards. Oh, okay, cool. So what Chris is talking about is we have been working on a code design. Ocean Thunder carrier battles. And I think it's going farther away from our original design concept, which <laughs> no surprise. I mean, that's it what happens. They, that's what they do. <clears throat> um, but I think it's still going to, one of our goals of doing that was to, one, kind of fit into a 55 card framework. We're going to try to meet the, that, that guideline. And again, that's not a requirement. That's more of a guideline that, some people want to have constraints, so we're going to have a constraint up there, but it's totally optional this time. Unlike the postcards from the front, you pretty much got to put it on a postcard. That won't change um, because that's kind of the theme. So we're not going to, you know, let you have a huge map um, unless you can. Not have anything can you do it, so I'm not even going <laughs> to. Good. Have but a fold it. <laughs> Get an exacto knife and slice it in half. I don't know. So um, I was able to get everything we needed in 54 cards. Oh, perfect. So 27 cards each side. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's what we wanted. And, you know, we're supposed to have, you know, 55, whatever. We got an extra one. It's no big deal. So, yeah, again, that is open now for your submissions. And one of the things that we also started – was a, something that came up in Discord a um, couple, three, four weeks ago, was a request to maybe do some play testing of games and do it, we could do it live. And so kind of impromptu, I was talking with Richard in Discord the night before Friday night, and we decided to go live on Saturday. So we actually took his game, it was on Tabletop Simulator, we had a number of people <clears throat> in the, the stream, and we were on for about two hours. And we could have easily gone another two hours and played that game. Uh, I think we got one turn in, and the beauty of game designers is you just start opening up and, hey, I, what about this? Or how about if you do that? Or you could try this. And, um, yeah, I was digging it. it. It reminded me a lot of when I meet up with designers in real life. We sit around a table playing each other's games. That was the exact feel that we got. And I'm calling it the play testers. So it's going to be another podcast once I figure out how to put two up on my account, um, at least on Spotify. Um, but we will be doing it Saturdays. I'm going to start 10 o'clock Pacific time. I don't want to, I'm trying to avoid bumping into the War Room, which is ID Jester's show. They've been doing their show for 200 years, and so I don't want to <laughs> interfere with them. And so I think it's better to do it early 
then later. So, but if we need to move it around, just keep in mind, we'll move that one around. So we're going to be doing, at least initially, the games that we're putting into the card jam, because that's kind of the active jam and we want to play test some of those. But if you guys have got a game that you would like to have play tested, <clears throat> really simple, join the Discord. There'll be a link in the, the description here. And go to the playtesters channel and just introduce yourself and say, hey, I've got a game. I'd like to get it play tested. And trust me, we have a number of people that enjoy playing these types of games. And we can get it configured or get a time frame with you. And the one thing that we would ask is that we could videotape it and put it onto the podcast. Uh, excuse me. So if there are publishers out there that want us to play test, we could probably work something out as well. Now, you may not want your game being published right away, but it could be something that we could videotape it, save it until you release the game, and then publish it at that, that point in time. Because we don't want to mess with, you know, you, you keep things secret, and, and we want to respect that. So we'd be open to that. So, again, if anybody's got some, some games they want play tested, we're trying to build the community. You know, you hear me say this a lot. And it's not just about the games we design, but also if we, because <clears throat> finding play testers is hard. We know this. Um, so what we're hoping is that we can provide a service to the community by having people that are at least passionate enough about some of these games and know how to give some decent feedback and give you some honest feedback on your games. And then if we're videotaping it, you can then take that back and watch it, you know, whenever we can give you copy again even if we don't publish it to a later date you can use that to review and, and get some feedback on you know at least what our thoughts are so let me just check chat real quick we got meandering mike came in and said uh greetings y'all charles says evening and not jay and uh, eric just responding to them saying hi to everybody Yeah, let me get that for you real quick. Mike is asking, can you post a link to the card game jam here in chat, please? Oh, look at that. Eric's already on it. <laughs> Got it, sir. Got it done. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. There you go, Mike. So with the short week and the holidays, I did not get a chance to get a guest for us, but that's okay. We're going to just talk about a few things. Uh, later on in the show, I want to start – uh, a new segment that we'll do every show. And right now the working title is I Like It. And basically we're going to talk about a published game. At least it, maybe it doesn't need to be published. Again, this is a stream of consciousness here, but um, a mechanic or how a game plays that we really like. And we can do a little deeper dive into it and talk about it so that maybe that inspires you to look at that particular game to maybe do something like that. Um, oh, he says it's not visible in our live chat. Oh, interesting. Um, so we'll send it again, see if you can see it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and so the idea behind the I like it is, again, to kind of highlight some mechanics, see if it's something that, you know, what we like about it, and maybe something you can explore to put in one of your designs, or maybe something that you as a player might want to say, hey, that looks kind of cool. Maybe I'll pick that game up because I'd like to see how that mechanic works. So with that, and I, I kind of glossed over it, I do want to say hi to not Jay. Howdy, folks. To Eric. Hello. Welcome, guys. Appreciate you as always being here. And the topic for tonight is, as you can tell from the title, you know, calm down and wait your turn. I kind of wanted to talk about, as a designer, when we get into designing kind of the core loop the the game sequence your turn sequence and how we might determine 
how players move or take actions or what they do on their turn, how much they can do on their turn, and how much their opponent slash opponents are involved in that through interrupts or overwatch or whatever other mechanic might be used in the game to allow a player to be involved during somebody else's turn and to what capacity that might take. And there are a lot of different mechanics out there that are used for, for doing games, uh, game turns. And to me, this is kind of really an important aspect of your design. You hear me talk a lot about uh, game experience, the experience that I want you as a player to have. And I think that game turn or game sequence, turn sequence, is key in providing or can be key because it's nothing is absolute, <clears throat> but it can be key in that gaming experience. If you're playing a game and it's your turn and you're constantly having to remember there's 47 different things you can do and you're going to the rule book or a cheat sheet and you're looking it up and you're pondering what you want to do, that takes you out of that game, right? That takes you out of that suspended belief of I'm a sniper, I'm a combat pilot, I'm in a tank, I'm, I'm high, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, whatever you're doing. <laughs> I, mean, I can go on for hours, right? Um, and so I think that the turn sequence is critical to that. The second thing I think that comes into play is just how much one player can do, and other people are sitting around watching and waiting and have no agency. Now there's no, in my opinion, there's no perfect system. There's no, nothing that's going to simulate real time action in a board game. If that's what you want, video games do that very well. We're not going to get it in a board game. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so with, kind of that caveat, we can talk about different systems, we can be critical of them to some degree, what your thoughts are. And just, we can start diving into a, a few of these. Um, before I do, what, thoughts from from you, Jay, or, or not? See, I'm getting lazy and I'm shorting not Jay to Jay and you're not Jay, that's the whole point. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and at least it's not Jay and not Chris. It's not Jay and is Chris. <laughs> it, it was just easier just call me Chris. I don't care. It's, it's, I'm not hiding behind the name. I know. <clears throat> it's just the uh, nom de plume, so to speak. Oh, no, I keep saying Chris. I meant Eric. Oh, my God. Because I was using his. You're killing me. <laughs> hey, dude, it's been a short week, but it's been a long week. <laughs> Yeah, ponder that one. Anyway, so what do you kind of, before we get into anything specific, what are your kind of thoughts on this? I mean, I kind of laid out kind of my parameters on what I think in general. Oh, well, it's the question again. I'm sorry. Oh, just kind of just in general on, you know, I talked about what I thought why well, game turn was important and how it affects the narrative, potentially the, the, the experience and agency for players, just in general, how I think that that can be very important with the pacing of a game and keeping you where you're not taken out of that suspension of disbelief. So for me, I'll just jump in and because I can talk about anything ad infinitum. Um, the more in, the more engaging ways of having uh, game turns uh -huh. is let, let, me, let me reword this. <clears throat> I'll start off by saying I don't like I go, you go. Okay. I don't like I do all my things, then you do all your things. <clears throat> the reason for that is that as a player, I'm watching you do all of the stuff and I'm sitting back mm -hmm. 
disengaged. Yeah. And a, because a perfect example is Warhammer 40,000. Or um, uh, Battlefront uh, Flames of War. They are ultimately... I'm going to sit back and watch it. Not, there's nothing I can do to interrupt what you're doing. So I can just sit back and I can, I can look at my phone. I can flip through the rule book. There there's, you know, so many things that I can, I would, I could do. And it doesn't matter if I'm paying attention to you or not, because when it's my turn, I can look at the table uh -huh. and see what has happened. So the, the two games that I go to most often when talking about ways to keep uh, game gamers involved is Fistful of Lead and Force on Force or Ambush Alley. Because both of them have uh, a different way of activation. They're, they're, they're completely different types of activation, mm -hmm. but they keep all the players engaged the entire time. Because uh, with... <clears throat> excuse me. With Fistful of Lead, of course, you've got a hand of cards, and you have to be paying attention as to what card has been called, because if you've got a queen, and it's a queen of hearts, and you really need to, to heal up one of your characters, and you don't throw down the queen when they call for queens, and they make it down to the tens, like, oh, wait, but I've got a queen. Sorry. You're shit out of luck. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and, and with force on force uh, in the and I know a lot of people don't like force on force because it requires you to have a scenario you can't just you, you can't do a pickup game with force on force oh, really? personally that's what I love about it is you've got to have a scenario because in the scenario parameters determines how you figure out who's got the initiative, who's the IP, and who's the NIP. And how does that uh, – is it a, are you able to shift who the IP is? The IP stands for initiative player. Okay. So in the uh, – so in the setup, in the scenario, it'll tell you IP player is the Americans uh, to start or for the entire game. And why that's important is because as the initiative player, when you, you, go, you get to move a team first, as the non-initiative player, you have the ability to react to that movement okay any any of your any of the nip units that can see the ip unit moving or doing whatever it's doing and there are some things that won't trigger and then there are some that and you know there's others that will trigger the ability to interrupt but uh so the now, do you move, move one unit or all units? In so the, this is one of the things with the original Ambush Alley and then again with Force on Force, the Osprey edition, is you could have this cascading event where I move one unit and you react. And in that reaction, let's say you're going to fire. Uh -huh. At my moving to, uh, as uh, to, as my team moves, you're going to fire on my team when it's out in the open. Well, then a a fire action triggers one of my team, my one of my other uh, teams that has not activated yet 
to interrupt yours well it, by shooting but in turn that causes one of the right. viewers to and so there's this cascading event and it, it it could get very daunting how you fix that simply is shit ton of terrain uh-huh. so you know you don't have these unimpeded you know sight lines or you just say you, you just put a limit to the number of uh, uh, of interruptions you can have. You know. You, okay. You can. Interrupt That's very me. much sounding like Magic: The Gathering. I, I interrupt your interrupt with an interrupt that interrupts that interrupt. I don't know. The the, the thing is, is and then I how, it. But how you uh, figure out who goes first on the interrupts? Magic: The Ocean Thunder. <laughs> yeah. So I know. So but the thing is is once once the IP player has done all of all of his actions with all of activations with all of his teams the non-initiative player uh can then make any movements or activations for any team that has not uh, who has not done an interrupt. Got it. So if you wanted to just sit back as the NIP and do nothing as my my teams activate, that's on you. Yeah, well, you have the agency is your point, right? Right. You, you can sit back and wait for me to get real close before you spring that trap on me. So, uh, but again, it's keeping you engaged because you've got to watch what I'm doing to say, this is, this is the best time for me to jump in. Right. Uh, Telemachus. Oh yeah. It, it is. I have seen a 13 team interrupt chain. Oh man! Horse. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot. It okay, that's 40, getting that's getting on the MTG level, to be honest. It took it took uh, it took forty five minutes to just figure out what was going to happen based off of that one activation. See, okay, I, I'm going to tread on, and, and that's why here. the new. That's why in the new rules that they're releasing, they. Uh, they have put a limit to the okay. number of interrupts. I was going to say, I haven't played the system, so I try to reserve judgment until I've actually played it. But well, I mean, you've again, got 45 minutes of resolving 13 interrupts. That's crazy. That because to me, I there's, think a round of, there's a round of fire each time. Yeah, no, no. I, I, Again, because so, I haven't yeah, experienced it. it okay, yeah, when I, it, I played it and experienced it, maybe what I'm going to say will be hogwash. But no, it's it not hogwash. It was garbage. I hated it. <laughs> okay. Say, well, but... I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying not to go there because I haven't played it. It just seems yeah. to me that that's a bit much. Maybe one or two interrupts kind of makes sense. Right. I do something, you can interrupt. Maybe I interrupt it and you get one and cap there. To me, makes right. Sense. Since. And again, how you fix that without changing the rules is put in enough terrain that you don't have these interrupted sight, uninterrupted sight lines. Right. I mean, well, it's a fair point. And that goes, <laughs> and it, okay. And you talked about it being scenario based. So it sounds like that could be done through the scenarios. Yeah. Can be controlled. Because if you can't do a pickup game, because quite honestly, people doing a pickup game may not have terrain. They might just throw a few bushes out there, not think about it, and end up with a thirteen interrupt turn. Well, so. and that's that's the other thing. Most most gamers, most uh, uh, most tournament style gamers don't ever put out enough terrain. <laughs> Or ammo, uh, Mad Nerd Workshop says that's where mana comes in. Fair point. Right. Fair point. Well, see, the thing is, though, it's assumed that 
because force on force is essentially it, it in 28 millimeter it is played on a three normally it will be played on a three by three or three by four table in 28 millimeter in yeah. 15 millimeter it's a two by two or a two by three table you're in the, you're in it immediately oh. okay then that this brings up another a note i had jotted down about turn sequence and stuff but we'll get into that in a minute but remind oh. me first turn miniature games i see a problem in many of them yeah in my it, I, I am I'm not a fan of it unless it is a bigger you know a, a, a bigger scope of a, of a game like you're looking at uh, well let me ask you this. levels or bigger there there I I don't if I'm playing a game that is platoon size and smaller I should be in I should be shooting him first round i should be in it first go yeah you're, you're stealing my thunder but yeah <laughs> <laughs> sorry just, no no we're on the same wavelength guy that, that's yeah that now now if i'm i'm dealing with <laughs> i've got a company or, or a battalion that i'm using like I'm, I'm doing my uh my micro armor or my pico armor Mm -hmm. And yeah, there there's gonna be maneuvering because that's part of that size that, of the that, game. That pico armor you get on tacos, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, it makes it crunchier. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> so let's let's back up a little bit. Um, I do have a question about force on force. You've played it. If anybody in in chat has played it, please chime in. I haven't played it yet. You haven't? Okay. Well, then just Why be not? quiet. Just be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Fast. So the question is, and it goes back to experience of playing the game. And I know there are many of us who love to play the mechanics of a game. And that is rolling dice, looking up a chart. Uh, even if it takes us out of World War II squad level combat it's the gaming experience that we like so even if you have a 45 minute one turn 13 interrupt back and forth if you love that type of crunch and rolling that and doing that that 45 minutes is probably very well spent and not For a bad maybe <laughs> well <laughs> and, and maybe it's personal taste here yeah. no uh, no I, I agree because if it and, and again, I'm not going to tell you what your what you like. I might think it, and like Chris says, and yeah, and I'll know that you're wrong. <laughs> but, but at the end of the day, here we go. Yeah, and tacos. Oh, I think it depends if um, the 13th erupts here. Is it immersive enough for everyone that's playing? Like, is it? something that everyone's enjoying at the same time or is that a person or two sitting there like this sucks i'm not doing anything so in it's that in that situation there, there was there was four players on the table mm -hmm. two, two to a side yep. and all all of them had every player had at least two people doing an interrupt now when it was all said and done it was like that was ridiculous now, yes, we were all involved. That 45 minutes really did go by pretty quickly. But we all agreed that was ridiculous. <laughs> okay. And, gotcha. And uh, we, from that point on, we, we, we self-imposed a cap. Again, in the rewrite of the rules, there is a new rule-imposed cap. And to what uh, Nerd was saying, it only allows so many rounds of ammunition per side. So every time a particular in the game, every time a particular unit uh, is in a round of fire, mm -hmm. they lose a firepower die. So in a, in a fire team of four, okay, where you've got two two riflemen, a uh, 
a saw gunner and a grenade a grenadier. You've uh-huh. got four, you get one for each dude because he's cool. Yep. Then you got an additional one for the uh, for the saw and one additional for the under uh, slung grenade launcher. So you got si- you, you'll have six dice. Yep. To fire. Um, so the first round of fire, you got six dice. The next round of fire during that activation or during mm-hmm. that turn, mm-hmm. you only have five. The next round of fire, you only have four. Is that during the interrupt or is that just normal sequential? Period. Back and forth? Regular. Period. Okay. Okay. Each time that team is in a round of fire, yeah, it loses a die. The thing was is that there was there was no so like this team would be in two rounds of fire. It, it was a, it was a chain basically, right? So you would no team lost more than three dice for the entire the entire thing. Yeah, I, I can. Yeah, because the way you read the rules is firing isn't necessarily going to cause you to lose a dice because you're, you're well, no. Interrupted. Every time you fire during the. Every, you lose a die every time you exchange fire with another team. But there was never a team that was in a firefight more than twice. Oh, okay. For that entire thing. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. So it was a chain. You know, this one fired here. So this team fired here. So they fired back and forth. And then once that was done, then we went to this one. And then from this one, six down to five. And they had six, and then they shifted, and yeah, it, okay. it, was, it was ridiculous. It just, uh, I don't know, it, it, this rule sounds very clunky to me. It, they're not. They're not at all. Oh, okay. No. Um, well, so I, I, can, have, I can have you playing the game uh, in under 15 minutes. Oh, okay. okay. With, so all, it, with all the okay. rules you need to know. To run the game with with somebody that is okay, a good enough game master. Okay, they can get, and this to me is a sign of a good set of rules. If you mm-hmm. can do a game briefing in under fifteen minutes and get people rolling dice in under fifteen minutes, yeah. Now, I are think... they going to ask questions as they go? Sure, yeah. just like just like on uh, Tuesday, mm-hmm. we we were rolling dice within. 10 or 15 minutes of their five minutes, <laughs> yeah, five minutes, you know. Yeah, no. that's true. So I'm not, I'm not saying that I'm a great, great game master. I'll say it. I've been doing it for you're a not very a great game time. master. Thanks. <laughs> um, but oh. I've been doing it for a very long time. No, you're, you're skilled. You're skilled. So Tom Micah says, I tortured my game group with it many times. They <laughs> like the shooting fast and furiously. But also yep. did not like the weird wound system FOF had. FOF being force on force. Yeah. So is, yeah, right. is this game by the same people that uh, do Water Tanker? No. No. Uh, oh, okay. Force on Force is by uh, Sean and Robbie Carpenter of Ambush Alley Games. Uh, oh, okay. of, uh, Enid, Oklahoma. And published by Osprey, right? Osprey. Oh, cool. Osprey. Uh, Osprey. Uh, they. Uh, they came to uh, th- they were self-published first. Okay. Osprey came and said, hey, we we would like to get into the gaming scene. We wouldn't have any of the Blue Book, Osprey Blue Book games or Gaslands or any of that without Ambush Alley and Force on Force. Okay. All right. Um, Napalm. So- so they, you know, produced the the hardback game plus uh, eight companion books and mm-hmm. a hardback of the. Uh, hold on, hold on. Isn't Xbox there something game. in that book you'd like to show us? One more mean, time. Um, you, you mean my name right there? There we go. Out of boy. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Hey. Um, People might not yeah, know. So, published. So, the, so the, the scenario, the, why did my, 
Yeah. All right. So, you know, talking about the scenarios, you've got um, how they have it laid out is in a specific way. It mm -hmm. tells you uh, how long the game will run for. Um, so in my scenario, I had eight turns. Uh, initiative, it tells you who has initiative and how it can change. It says that the allies have initiative throughout the game. The Germans are controlled by random events. Because it's a solo, okay, it's a solo game, yes. or it's a solo scenario. So the Germans are following a, an AI, basically. Right. Uh, then you know, if you've got fog of war, and why is it that most have, solo AIs play exponentially faster than human players? Uh, analysis paralysis. Think long, think wrong. Yeah, I just, tell just that. Think on that one. Just think yeah, on I, that one. I have to tell that to my buddy Chris Copeland all the damn time. And the other thing we have to tell him all the time is stop leaning on the table. That's not in the game oh. sequence. So let me let me pull us back a little bit on on topic here. Um, we had to get your plug in though, so I don't. Oh, of course. <laughs> it's not that they're so mad. Nerd Workshop says they are smarter. Um, that might be true. I've I've been impressed. By Again, the depends AI. on the human player, and and that there's two factors involved. But the 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 joke was that I was trying to make is exactly what uh, Chris said is there's other once you understand how the bot works, it makes a decision and it moves on, and a well designed bot is going to play halfway decently. And the point I'm making is sometimes as players, we think way too much and we really don't need to. Um, also, with that, mm -hmm. we're giving way too many options sometimes to choose from. Agreed. Way Agreed. too many options. So let me ask. Um, so, Tal Micah says, mm, fog of war, question mark, talking about the AI. Yeah, there is some fog of war there. Now, if you've played a game a few times and you've seen all the options, then you start guessing on what it might be doing and, and, and adjusting for it, which is fine. Um, you know, if you enjoy the game that much that you played it to that point, good on you. And then uh, Nerd says, uh, they kick my ass all the time. You're not alone, Mad, mad Nerd. Not alone. Yeah. And so there's maybe something to be learned from understanding how uh, AI bots work. And we're going to have a whole whole um, episode on that. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, the whole thing here with turns and players. Well, that's be nerd, it's because you were attacking me, and I really only had to just watch you die, basically. Because you gave me the options you gave me were so juicy, I didn't really have much thinking to do. <laughs> Is no, 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 no. I, you know what? I'm, we're gonna, I'm gonna see him again this year, and he's gonna wipe the table with me. Watch, it's gonna be nice. But um, you were saying, Eric? I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Um, I think the it really matters on what type of game you're playing, as uh -huh. far as you know, the decision making, you know, and um, how you get immersive into sad game. Because um, let's let's say if it's a multiplayer game, right? If you're given a whole menu of actions that you can do, uh -huh. the more players you have, the more added time you have around the table, right? Yep. So for example, you know, if you're giving four actions and you have a menu of 20 actions to pick from, you know, turns are going to take 10, 15 minutes, probably. Yeah. If actions take a while as well, you know. Um, and I think that that's the downfall of some games when it comes to expedited play. And I don't mean playing fast here. I mean by more streamlined options. Or right. more efficiently. More efficient. Um, also, it makes it more interesting for newcomers too. 
and again, I'm getting into more of the war games here, not just general board games, right? Um, because it is, it, it's a little harder to bring new newcomers to this side of the table to play a war game, right? Yeah. And that's why I'm going, that's where I'm going with this, because if we're trying to get more people to play more games that we would like to play, we need to, you know, uh, start looking at games a little bit that way as far as, you know, um, how are the turns every turn? Like, how right. fast do they go? What can the other players do while I'm setting up my stuff here when it's my turn? Are they just standing there? Can they do anything while I'm doing this? Right. So I feel like we can make, you know, um, better decisions as far as when games are being designed that we're paying attention to everyone that's on the table and not just the active player. Well, let me ask you this thing on that point, because, mm -hmm. and I have an answer to this question, you know, yep. like a good lawyer, I guess, <laughs> at least my answer. Um, but when you're designing a game, how do you go about structuring or thinking about your player turn sequence? Um, I'm assuming it would be different with a solo game than a two player game, but let's it, just say, let's take a two player game or yeah. a multiplayer game. It doesn't have to be two. It can be multiplayer. Yeah. The, the, how does so, the, how does the turn structure for you play into it? Does theme affect it? Um, I'm not, I won't give you softballs. Why don't you explain to me yeah. how you kind of tackle that? Well, from my brief experience, right trying to design games. I, I mean, I've played more than obviously designed, but um, I think it depends, you know, if, if it's, again, if it's a game where, like I, we played Wizards Quest this past weekend, right? We played four people, two people really non-war gamers, right? Uh, which is fine, which is fine, because I feel like Wizards Quest, I, I don't know if you've played it before, Mike, no. Uh, highly recommended, and it's funny because on Wiz Wizard's Quest, you get one action for your turn. Okay. The setting up of the beginning of the round is procedural because you have to place orcs on the board. You have to uh, place the dragon, the the wizard. You know, you have a few procedural things that you do. And then it's the player's turn, and it just goes around the table. But it's so, it's so quick, uh -huh. player's turn itself, that um, you know, it just it just makes the game go by like that, you know, because everyone's already like, oh, okay, so what do I do? I just, you know, I do, you know, I, I, I try to capture a territory, which okay. capturing is attacking. Um, and um, it's it's very quick, you know. Um, yep, word frenzy. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's a hilarious <laughs> game. Um, but again, that nerd just makes me laugh. It goes with this that we're saying here because. Um, well, okay, so I, I'm gonna. Mm -hmm. My question was, how do you factor that into your design? Yeah. So, I mean. I haven't really designed multiplayer games. Um, okay. It's harder to balance with multiplayer than solo, you know, because the bot does help a lot in solo. Um, I think so the, too. The, you know, the, the system itself helps expedite uh, the balancing issues because with multiplayer, if you're doing a two player game, it's, you know, you got to get the right level of balance for both sides, whether you're doing it, you know, uh, asymmetric play or, you know, whatever. Uh -huh. um, so it's a little harder, but I do try, at least on my case, to make um, the more streamlined actions as possible, as in on your turn, you get to take one or two actions, then it's the next player's turn. That's what I try to go with. Um, and going with what Jay was, 
not Jay was just saying. I just don't like people waiting around. Yeah. I don't like people waiting around. I don't like analysis paralysis. That's why I, on my games, I try to cut down the amount of consulting that you need to do on the rule book, for example. Like yeah. I want my I want my actions to be as clear as possible. So if you march, right, you're going to spend an action token or an activation token. Mm -hmm. You can march one space. That's it. If you're going to attack, you're going to use an activation token to attack the space adjacent to you. That's it. You know, things like that. You know, I, I, I'm obviously being very, you know, very simple here on yeah, well, the things I'm saying, but. Yeah. <clears throat> You've heard me say this before, and uh, it's nothing I made up. It's I think it's just true is the simplest designs are the hardest to design. When somebody's playing a game and they don't feel the rules, I mean, occasionally yep. looking them up is one thing, okay? Yeah. But if you can get through that fairly quickly where you're playing the game, then you as a designer can control that experience more. And I think... The more you put into a game when it comes to turn sequence, the more rules you're going to have, the more opportunity you're going to have for somebody to break out of that third wall and have to go get the rule book to what do I do in this situation? Or, oh, I forgot I was supposed to check my morale before I did this. And when you have a much more streamlined um turn sequence, I think it makes it easier to learn to play a game yeah. and play, and then for players to play it as, I was going to say correctly, but I'm going to change that to say, play it as it was designed to be played. Efficiently. There you go. Yeah, which may or may not be correctly. <laughs> it could be a bad design. Yeah, absolutely. And, I, I, uh, and again, Mike, I, I, I truly believe that, you know, if you can do the best you can to just streamline your rules mm -hmm. so there is less and less consulting and that you're really immersive, immersed into the game itself, that you're not thinking about, oh, oh gosh, how, how do I do siege combat again? Or how, you know, how do, which table do I roll this on? You know, because I, I really think that takes away, you know, you're not oh, strategizing totally. anymore. When you're doing well, that was this. one of the parameters I, I talked about with your turn sequences. It can take you out of the gaming yeah. experience. And again, unless you're, there are people, uh, and you hear this a lot in the board gaming community, the hobby board gaming, where they'll, they'll say a game is crunchy. And mm -hmm. that is a game that's got a lot of rules. It's more complex. And there are people who like to play those games Sure. And we have them in, in war games, too. And there's a sense of accomplishment when you can play a complex game sure. and play it successfully. It's like solving a jigsaw puzzle or a, a very difficult crossword puzzle, right? Because not only did you navigate through the rules and the, the convoluted turn sequence, um, but you actually then spent six months playing that game to some conclusion Yep. And again, if, if you're enjoying that experience, that's that's a successful game as far as I'm concerned. And again, Mike, what I'm saying <laughs> is not that I dislike complex games or, or games that have a lot of rules. Uh -huh. But here's the, the, the thing, right? There's a difference between a complex game and clunky rules. Agreed. Very different. Very different. You know, um, because some games, if they're done well enough, you can even understand the mechanics of the game by the thing that's behind it. Because the designer did such a great job, you know, marrying the rules with the, the, the theme that they make sense. You just, oh, yeah. just click. And some games, both both of them are so 
far away from each other that it makes it so difficult or not explained well enough? Turn sequence, I think, is is a driving factor in that, right? Yes. Um, and I've seen some games that have a turn sequence that makes complete sense. Oh, it's obvious that you're going to do this before you do that. Yep. Um, and other times you question, yep. why can't I do this before? Because logically right. you're looking at that going, I should be able to do this before I do that. And sometimes as designers, we have to gamify it or put a rule yep. in. Yep. Because we haven't been able to, it either can't be done or we as designers haven't figured out how to abstract something sure. to a simple enough rule. And that's where the complexity of designing some of these games can come into. Yeah. So when I asked you about how do you, when you design a game and you think about your turn sequence, Mm -hmm. um, Hold on one second. So, oh, hi, Stevie Joe. Thanks for joining us, boss. It says, interesting topic. Hi, guys. If a game is complex, it better be worth it. Yep, exactly. Agreed. Well, I, I don't know where you came in on the conversation, boss, but we were saying that there are people who enjoy playing a game, the actual mechanics, the rolling the dice, the looking up the table, the doing the math, that that is part of the enjoyment they have and i talk about in game designs that i do i want to provide an experience but mm -hmm. my definition of experience isn't the same as somebody who likes a very complex look at the charts do my math min max and then roll the dice and and see what rng does for me right because part of that challenge is when you're min maxing is how can I um, solve this problem in an efficient way to increase my chances of mitigating that risk? And a lot of so, times that's where some complex rules allow you to do certain things to, to get to that end result of rolling that dice and having it abstract out. Hey man, I like Chrome in my games. <laughs> Just not too much that I can't- Yeah, we remember. talked about Chrome. <laughs> it's not too much that I can't remember them. So, so the answer I was looking for that you didn't give me, and not that, yes, sir. Not that you're wrong, uh, but one of the things that I try to do, now this is more so when I was, when I was, I still do, if I design a, a hobby board game, is I, I go, I have a, an idea for a game, and I keep coming back to Mythic. But in that particular game, one of the things I did when I started to construct my turn sequence was I said, okay, if I've got three to five players and I want this game to last an hour mm -hmm. and I was giving myself some parameters. Yep. Because if you go to a game night, you might want to get more games in and you might be there for three to four hours. So I didn't want a two hour game. I wanted a game that was about an hour and mm -hmm. it gets into my philosophy on game balance. I think a game is, it's less important to balance a game, the shorter the game is. If it's completely imbalanced, um, flipping a coin, there's no balance to that. Well, it's 50, 50, or is it? Mm -hmm. um, but if you lose, you flip again, you can go right away. Right. Um, and so I take the number of players divided by the time that I want the game to be. And that'll give me a ballpark idea of how long a, an ideal turn should last. And you'd be surprised. Sometimes it comes down to four or five minutes. Mm hmm. Well, four or five minutes, then I break that down into, okay, what am I asking a player to do, the decisions to be made, and, and the actions that they have to do? Can right. that reasonably be done within that time frame? If not, now I'll over-design. I always mm -hmm. try to over-design on purpose, knowing I'm going to cut back, right? Yeah. So if I come up with 10 things in a game, I'm going to cut three of them right off the top of my head. I'm just saying I'm going to cut three out. And so I got my seven best. And even then it might go down to four things that stay in the game. And 
we've experienced that in the postcard challenge, right? Because you don't have a lot of room to put a lot of turn sequence and write the rules on what you're going to do in that turn sequence. So that format mm -hmm. in a lot of ways forces and, and you see some of these games are fairly deep when it comes to gameplay, mm -hmm. but they fit on a five by seven rules, tokens, whatever. So your rules don't even fit on five by seven. You got a little bit less of space. And, and so the point I'm getting at is that's how I structure the beginning of my turn sequence in games where I have a time limit. Now, not all my games I design around a time limit. But when I do, I now if it's a four or five player game and you want to fit into two hours, that what a player can do, that time shrinks. And so you right. have to be very cognizant of what that turn sequence looks like and how quickly they can get through it. And so to your point, yes, you give them options, but those options, and one of the ways that I did it with um, mythic is you have minions and those minions each have an ability. Okay. And the turn sequence is based on each location has a, a first slot, second, third, and fourth slot. And there's a, there's a worker placement aspect of the game where everybody goes around and strategically places their, their workers where they want face down. Mm -hmm. That defines that whole turns turn sequence by location. So yep. I might have two turns back to back. I might have none because I didn't put anybody consciously in that location. Mm -hmm. And then as you go through that one person taking their turn, they have very specific abilities for that minion. Yep. And the option to do a very, they can do a lot of things during the game, but during that slice of time, I pared down those choices. They don't have a lot of choice. Right. On the grand scheme, when they do their play, their their worker placement, all the things that you can do, you have a lot of choices. But when you get down to your actual turn with that particular card in that location, it plays fairly quickly because yeah. you're either going to pull a card for evidence or you're going to play its ability. You don't have you a don't, lot of choices. Yeah, so I you don't, you don't a lot of game. choices with focusing on when you can make those choices down to yep. getting it to fit within that under an hour. It, it all depends on the kind of game you're making here, you know, because the turn sequence can change. You know, I, uh, what are we playing here? We're, are we playing a war game? Are we playing a social deduction game? You mm -hmm. know, are we playing poker? Look at poker. Poker is super fast. It can be. It's, it's super fast. You either pass, you bat, or you fold. Or you raise. Or you raise, you know, but it's fast. When 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 your turn comes, you know, you, you're ready. You 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 don't have a manual of twenty different things you can do, you know. Even if you raise and re-raise and then <laughs> whatever, you know. Um, well, they also have the dealer. I don't know if you know how poker works, at least in most poker rooms. But the the house wants a lot of hands played because they get a rake on the amount of money played. So they don't want people sitting around thinking. Now, if we had somebody that was running a game at a convention and they got paid <laughs> on how quickly turns were made, maybe we designed games that were, turn sequences right. were, were a little faster. Meandering Mike here is saying something that's important. Yeah, Meandering Mike says, complexity for its own sake is bad. Complexity that present interesting decisions for players that feel their time and mental effort was well paid off, that's good complexity. I 200% uh, agree with that. Yeah, I do too. And I think it goes back to what I was saying earlier about there are people who like crunchy for the sake of yeah. crunchy. And yeah. that's what they enjoy doing. And so the time that they put into to that is well served for them. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think as long as you have fun and your group is having fun, it's worth it. There you go. Yeah. If, there you go. Sometimes I hear people say, oh, I played this game for hours and I have a huge headache because I'm, you know, okay, did you enjoy it? No, not really, but I want to get through. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. I, 
I mean, it's not the game for you. Well, you know? sometimes that's a one-off experience too. You know, the bad day at work, you show up, you're just not in a gaming thing. Yeah. Sure. And not to get into all of those nuanced nuance things, but so yeah. I, I okay. did write down a few things when it comes to turn structure. So we talked about, I go, you go. Mm -hmm. Okay. And one of the problems, or let me rephrase that. One of the challenges, and I still have this challenge that faced me when I was learning ASL was the turn sequence is pretty intense on what you can do, when you can do it, and what mm -hmm. conditions can be met. And I struggled with that, and I still struggle with that game, although I like it. And, um, and I'm not getting into the way people game it and, you know, tournament play, because I don't play tournaments. So um, I, I sit down. I like to immerse myself in the narrative as, as much as I can, even in something that is – um, you know, very tactical like ASL is. Um, and then we have, and you, you kind of talked about this already with Fistful of Lead that uses a system of cards that get shuffled out. And so every turn, the turn order is semi-random. And the reason I say semi-random is there is some player agency in when you want to activate your card on a few of those cards. Correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, but aren't there a few that the, the the only, the delay? The only cards that you can say, no, no, I'm not going to go, or I want to play this card at a particular time, is the ace and the joker. Okay. But it's if, there. If, if the king is called and you have a king, now, if you don't play it on purpose, that's on you. But if you don't play it because, oh, I didn't hear or I wasn't paying attention, but I want to go, tough nuggets. <laughs> well, if, if you're playing in a play group, they may let you go anyway. No, you got to be paying attention. <laughs> you're not paying attention. That, that's the whole point. Uh, no, I love I love how I gave kind of a, like if I was running the game, I'd probably let you go. And you're like, yeah, no. <laughs> well, and, and again, if it's just like, you know, two or three folks, you know, together having fun. Yeah, that's not a problem. But when you're at a convention or you're at Jay Wiley's house where there's, you know, 10 guys there and they need to get a game done in three, three and a half hours. We're not waiting around for your ass. Pay attention, yeah, and go when your card comes up. Yeah, well, um, and, and that's that's the group that's played played together. Kind of has you know house rules on, on that point. So, yeah. so Nerd Workshop says <clears throat> the more realistic you make a game, and the more variables you have, you naturally bring in more complexity. And let me just read his next one, and because I do have a comment on that one. As a designer, you need to find the balance of fun gameplay and realistic rules so games are enjoyable but still seem a realistic retention of the battle. I agree with that 100%. Yes and no. I was going to do a yes and no to this, and the, we might have the same thing. So why don't you go first, boss? Uh, um, so You want to say yes or no here? <laughs> both, actually, it, okay. it, and they're tied together. Okay. <clears throat> what people confuse with realism and crunchiness is, uh, or, or, or where they get confused is they think by adding complexity, they're adding realism. And that's not necessarily the case. True. You can have very realistic results and not be very crunchy at all. Again, it goes back to, are you a process gamer or are you a results gamer? Now, if you're, if and I'm not telling, I'm not saying that there is one way that's better than the other as, as a whole, as right. in general. For me, I don't like process gaming. I, 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 I do. I, 
I look at the Fletcher Pratt rules for World War II Naval Wargaming. And people think, oh, they're some of the most realistic game game design in the world. Well, it's realistic in the fact that you are apparently taking the role of the captain and the five-inch uh, gun director in the gun mount because you were figuring out what the angle of the gun has to be to fire at a particular range, be able to get the penetration of your five-inch <laughs> round into the armor of that particular heavy crew garbage now if that's if you want to play that way by all means play that way yes please have fun doing that don't expect me to have fun when you put a book of charts in front of me that might as well have been produced by the united states navy circa 1941 for five inch gun turrets not gonna happen i think and, and I have been told that Ocean Thunder provides realistic, historically viable outcomes. See, I think that's the key. Historically viable. Right. You, 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 you don't have, you know, I don't have to know, for, like on Force on Force. They make no difference between an M16, a uh, AK-47... And uh, FNFAL, mm -hmm. they're all semi automatic or automatic assault rifles, they're worth the same value. The difference is the amount of training the particular individual uses, thus, the type of die that they're using to be able to roll the four for this success. Yeah. If you're if you're a green troop or you you are a uh, you know if you're fresh you're a conscript fresh out of basic training, or you're uh, or or you're a uh, uh, an insurgent that they just threw uh, a rifle at and said go get them, you're rolling a d6. So to get a success of a four, you got a 50 50 shot. Oh, I really yeah. like when we were talking with Walkabout Games when he was talking about his combat mechanics in his game. We'll, we'll game on one night yeah. to talk about that. But that's, I think, handles realism with simple game. Yeah, practice. exactly. Yeah, you can. I think he's nailed it. You, you can. Ha I, and I, I want to get a hold of his rules because I, I want to play them. Oh, I've I got, know. I've got, I've got 15 millimeter U.S. infantry and Haji's. All day long, I got about fifty uh, uh, Arab gunmen uh, ready to go. Uh, that I play force on force. I'd love to get you know get his rules and play you know give him a, uh, give him a shot. Um, but and by the way, know, nerd said he agreed with what you were saying, Chris. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I wasn't. I wasn't in any way, shape, or form thinking that you know he was saying otherwise. It's it. Yeah. There, there's a to me a good game will give you that historically viable outcome without diving into the weeds. Yeah, I'm going to go back to his original statement. Yeah, because it seems more realistic. You make a game, the more variables you have, you naturally bring in more complexity. And yeah, so, you don't have where to. I I agree and, and is the the second condition. The more variable you have, I right. think the variable part brings in the complexity. The realistic, again, it, and we're talking in the context of a game, okay, <clears throat> that to your point, Chris, when you talk about realistic outcome, that to me is what, like, with, and I'll talk about Richtofen, an air combat doesn't take you an hour to hour and a half you're not moving miniatures and you don't have a turn sequence per se and you're not having to move up and down and elevation and and it, you don't have to look at a bunch of rules the game plays very quickly because the design was focused on 
whether or not you as a pilot had an advantage against your opponent or, or were at a disadvantage. And from that perspective, I don't want to say realistic because I've never been in air combat, okay? <clears throat> but what it does do is it gives you a Hollywood feel of I'm trying to evade getting shot so I can get on their tail. They're trying to keep up with me so they can bring their guns to bear on me. And that <clears throat> game does that very well. And you get that sense. And <clears throat> simple playing game, but trust me, it took quite a bit of thought and play test and back and forth before it played smooth. And so when you look at the rules, which I, for the 1v1, I put up on uh, Tabletop Simulator. And I'll put a link to that game and some of our other games um, in the description of, of this video. Um, but if you read the rules, it's all of three pages, I think. It's not overly complicated. And one of the tricks for me is the ability to put the rules on the card. And I know we talked about cards a week or so ago, but one of the, I think one of the advantages is you can have unique rules that when they come into effect, the player has them right in front of them. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not digging through a rule book because they've got the card that says, oh, I can do this, blah, blah, blah. And most card games, if not all, the card trumps the rule book. So yep. if the card says you can do something, you can do it. Yep. And that's a that's a designer sneaky way of taking that rule book and breaking it into a bunch of small pieces and feeding it to you just when you need it. Yep. So Nerd asks, well, yes, you don't have to. And that's where the designer make the decisions to how realistic and how playable. Right. Yes. So agreed. <clears throat> so in my design of Ocean Thunder, I, <laughs> I as the <laughs> damn it, Canada Canada Force Fires have kicked my ass. Sorry. I as a designer, the designer, have decided that all of what Fletcher Pratt makes the player do. I have done in the on the backside. So I mm -hmm. I figured out that you know a a 16 inch round from the Missouri traveling that distance will be able to penetrate that amount of armor et cetera and so forth you just need to roll a, a you need to roll a die and get your success number yeah you know that i i have i've got all the numbers to back it up because to me that is what's more to me seeing the outcome is more enjoyable than breaking out the freaking slide rules right um again if that's what you want to do then by all means you do that what? um but so in ocean thunder when you when you were building, try to steer this a little back to turn sequence. How did that? How did you tackle that? When you said, "Okay, I'm going to do a miniature game," and you've got and it's or any type of game, and all of us designers start with that blank page, right? We got an idea. How do we get it from here onto that page to make it work? And that at some point, that turn sequence pops up and we have to solve that problem or we come up with so, something to start with. So in Ocean, I, I have always felt that because of the distances we're dealing with, because of the amount of time it takes for shells that are fired to reach their target, in some cases, a minute or more. It doesn't make sense to have, well, I'm shooting before you shoot. So if I hit you, you don't, 
you know, you're, you're out of luck. Uh So everything is simultaneous within the turn or within this, that segment of turn. So as a player, I might do X number of things, but the effect does not go into play until after you as a player do your things. Right. And so for then instance, we resolve it. In so so for instance, in, in movement. Okay. Unless, unless we're in close order and might hit each other, it doesn't matter whether you move first or I move first. So movement is simultaneous. You just, okay, the turn starts. We're in the first move segment. Move, move your ships. I yeah. don't care if you're moving first or I'm moving first. Move your ships. Now, if it gets to where we're close enough that I might hit you or you might hit me, then it's up to the players to decide how are they going to figure out who goes first. If you want to roll roll an initiative die and high diet, by all means, do that. Okay, That's up to you. Same thing with gunnery. It doesn't matter whether I shoot first or you shoot first because – we're both going to get to shoot during that gunnery segment. Well, it's very thematic. Yep, exactly. Exactly. Because although we don't have an actual, a turn is X number of minutes written into the game. Yep. When, when my, <clears throat> when my buddy Chris Copeland sat down and wrote out the, 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 the sick chart the equation. Uh-huh. Oh that figured out because that's the first thing we did when we decided to pitch all of the rules that we had been using previously, which were heavily modified uh, general quarters one and and start from scratch. We decided, okay, the first thing we need to know know is how far are these, are these miniatures going to move on the table for, for each turn. Yep. And so we were playing in one twenty four hundred scale. We decided, okay, we're going to (laughs) use, arbitrarily we're going to make it five minute turns and he started calculating blah 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 etc and so forth came out with a damn equation that was literally (laughs) nine inches long right because he is mr math and knows how to do this bullshit i just said break it down to me he says are you ready i said yeah you take the speed you want to go in knots divide that by two and that's how many inches you move during the turn. Okay. So that's where the knots come from in knots, J. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so ostensibly, our turns are five minutes long. Well, if the turn is five minutes long, how many five-inch shells are fired from a dual purpose? So five minutes game time, not five minutes real-life playing time. So a game turn is five minutes of real life. Got it. Okay. Per player? Huh? No, the the turn because again everything's simultaneous. Everything is moving. Oh, that's true. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So, that's fast. So, you know, how how many times in f- five minutes can a single five inch thirty eight dual purpose uh, gunfire? Mm-hmm. I think it's. I think a five inch gun crewed by a well trained uh, team can get. Um, five to six rounds per minute for each oh, wow. gun. And there's 10 of them on the USS Missouri per broadside. Yeah, you can fire cool. at a high rate of speed. You can fire, I think it's two rounds per minute on us on the 16 inch guns on the Iowa's. So, so you're talking 10 shots from nine guns. That's 90 rounds in five minutes. And so you abstract that with obviously not 90 dice rolls. No, no. It, you That's abstract awesome. it out to a roll, a die roll per tube. Okay. And mm-hmm. again, because there's, you know, and again, that's maximum everything at top efficiency. Right. We're going, you know, it, they, so in the they case didn't of ever Ocean really. Thunder, what's that? You, so I'm just summarizing a little thought here. So turn sequence wise, in the case of Ocean Thunder, you looked at thematically the ships that were involved. Yeah. And you could have picked four minutes, you could have picked eight minutes. You you came up with the magic number five minutes. 
So you so you, you put your marker down. Now you've got something that you can tie all of your other mechanics to in your yep. turn sequence, right? Because that yep. now becomes the marker to say, as to you pointed out, we can get 10 shots off if you're well-trained, seven if you're not, whatever the case may be. But now you can start to abstract just by knowing that time, how many shots you get off, what your crew efficiency rate is, how you want to then abstract that damage. What is eight shots from a, a 16 inch gun as opposed to two shots from a the 50 inch gun. I know they don't exist. Right. But whatever. <laughs> yeah. So That'd be pretty badass though. Was, yeah. It would. So, <laughs> you know, so it was one of those things like, you know, do we want, do we need to worry about initiative? No. Because it's yeah. Well, that doesn't make sense of, for I go, you go. Nobody's going to sit around for five minutes while you're shooting at them. Right, right. exactly. And again, because I'm going to fire a round and you're going to fire a round and we're firing at such a long distance. I mean, we're talking uh, with the with the, with the 16 inch guns on the Iowa's they can fire out to like 30, 30,000 yards. You know, if you take 30 divided by six, that's what, five? Um, so let me ask you, is range really matter. an issue in your game? Yeah, it can be. Yeah. Because if I'm moving and you're moving, then my question is, at what point do you resolve it? Let's, for, and I'll give you a, a, a what if, it may not be realistic, we're... Our two ships are 24 inches apart. We both move. Now we're 18 inches apart. What's used for range? The 24, the 18, or something in between? So that's why you move, you fire, you move again. In a single turn. Okay. So I like that you, solution. So you move half the total movement. You fire. You move right. your second half movement. Because to me, what that's showing is you're firing the entire time. Yes. That you're moving, okay. right? So what that is, it's the average. the average. Bingo. See how simple that is? Yeah. Love it. Okay. That totally makes sense. So in that case, if you're thinking about turn sequence, yes, that's three separate things. A move resolution a fire resolution and a move resolution as opposed to a move and then a fire so you right. could make the argument that that slows the game down but i think the flip side and why you designed it that way makes complete sense is that sounds like a better design that is maybe air quotes more accurate or at least simulates that combat uh, a little bit better right. Because you're not saying, well, I'm not going to fire until you move closer. Well, I'm not moving closer to you fire. You, you don't. Yeah. And, and again, because, so. Yeah. It, it doesn't, like I said, it doesn't matter who moves first. That's why. And they're not, they're ships. They're moving. They're not going to stop one turn and move the next turn. They're not like infantry. Exactly. Exactly. Cool. So, uh, you know, and, and I'm not looking, I'm not looking to hide behind something unless I'm steaming to get behind that island right. um you know but but the point again the point of that is is that especially in a, in a convention setting you only have two and a half three maybe if you're lucky four hours to get a game in uh -huh. when you're dealing with six to eight players with each player having as many as four to six ships you gotta have. You gotta get shit going. You gotta. Well, again, it's kind of like what I said with Mythic. You do the math and you say, "I've got two minutes a turn." So whatever I'm doing, whatever yeah. those mechanics so, are in that turn sequence, somebody has so, to realistically be able to do that within that time frame. Yeah. So that's so, why you know when I'm running the game, and we're at the first turn of first move segment, I've done my 15 minutes of this is how the game is played. Let's go. Uh, turn one, everybody moves, and, and I, I literally say that everybody moves, and people are like, "What?" But who moved? That, j move your ships. <laughs> I like it. You know, okay. Because I'm moving, you're moving. 
at the same time, that's the most right. efficient play. And we're, we're, you know, we are literally on the other, the other side of the table. I mean, I, I normally run uh, on a four by eight or a five by eight table. And we're literally at least three feet apart at the beginning, if not more. So your movement is not affecting my movement at all. So that was a point I was going to bring up earlier. Um, and this it really isn't about turn sequence, so I'm not going to elaborate. And I think you kind of said it is um, in miniature games. I'm not a fan of everybody sets up in the first turn to three turns is moving to get in to position Ugh. because I find very rarely as there any strategic advantage that's gained for the amount of time that's taken to play those turns that you could not get by just handling during your initial setup. Yeah, exactly. That's and that, that's what I like night, about that, that's what I like about go ahead, uh, you can uh, you guys can respond. <laughs> that, that's what I like about chain of command. Um, have you ever played chain of command? So the first part of the game, each player well, actually, I did when I was married, but I never had the initiative. <sighs> nice. So each player, or each side, I should say, each side <laughs> has uh, four to five Sorry. Uh, what they call blinds, right? And you move the blind. You, you set you froze them up. up, boss. Are you still hearing me? Now we can. You froze up with the... Okay. So you got the little blinds that are, you know about the size of a poker chip or a little bigger. Okay. And you move, you move them as if they're your, one of your units. And you move them until you get within 12 inches of your enemy, which then locks them down. Once all four or five of these little blinds are set, you then uh, pick one, and you get the two closest enemy blinds, and they make a, a vector where you're at the apex. Uh -huh. And then behind you, you set up your jump-off point. The jump-off point there has to be at least six inches away from your blind, uh -huh. within that cone of variance, either in or behind a terrain feature. Okay. That is where you're, and you do that for all, you do that with uh, three, so you get three jump off points. Okay. Each side gets three jump off that points. That kind of illustrates my point. And that's where your units come out of. Yeah, so that I, that I'm totally cool with. Yeah, Eric, do you have anyone to add to this? What's that? Sorry. I was no, I was gonna give Eric a chance. I'm sorry, I didn't know you were weren't done. Keep yeah. going. And so when when you bring your troops on to the table, when you actually bring them onto the table within six inches of the, the, the jump off point, you're close enough to start shooting immediately. Yeah. So it's a game within a game to set up, and that's another nice thing about it is it's not just a strict line across the table. Yeah. The, the the front has now shifted on the table itself to you know be variable and then once it's locked down it's it could you could have a bulge you could have a it could be convex it could be shifted like that it's really a, a really cool way of doing it yeah Eric you wanted to add to that point uh, knife fight in the phone booth. <laughs> Those are the kind of games I like. Oh yeah, absolutely. And, and it, that, that's the thing with like four. I mean, if it's a competitive game like that, you know, and I'm usually not super, super competitive guy, as Chris probably understands by now from our game on Tuesday. <laughs> I destroy someone's, you know, Panzer, and then I apologize. Hey, oh, sorry, I destroyed you. But anyways. <laughs> um, no, but but those games are fun though, because it's like you know, it, if you move each piece so slowly, 
you know, it takes an hour just to get to range, to shoe or to, you know, melee, whatever. It's, it's, I mean, it's boring. You know, I, I'd rather be a little closer from the get go, not that close, so that well, you have a room to still maneuver around, yeah. be tactical about it, right? But um, I do like close quarters a little more when it comes yeah, so, to. And you, you bring up the same point that I was making is that um, you, you want to have a little bit of tactical play, but I feel most of the time, there's really no tactical advantage that you gain that you can't get through what Chris described with the setup, right? So just make the setup a little more engaging. Yeah. Get set up and then start rolling dice. Now, Mike brings up a really good point, though. Mandarin Mike says, double blind games, early maneuver to engagement can be some of the most exciting part. 100% agree. But that's a different what what you have there is the fact that because it's double blind and I don't know where you are, right? the game starts, the maneuvering is part of the game that has an effect. More yes. so yes. than I can see your minis, I can see my minis, and for the most part, we're just all going to move six inches forward, six inches forward, six inches right. forward, or whatever the case may be. And that's how Chain of Command does the double blind without being double blind mm. is because I, you don't know <laughs> you don't know where my my sniper is coming out you don't know where my m4 sherman's coming out you don't know where my machine gun team is coming out yep you just know that there's a jump off point over here and any damn thing can come out of it except for vehicles but, you know, any infantry can come out, you know, a mortar team can come out of there, a machine gun team can come out of there. Hey, in uh, my defense, nerd, you killed yourself. I, I didn't have to. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> uh, see, you, yeah. see you later, uh, Mr. Ormutt. Take care, buddy. Yeah, thanks, boss. See you, Ormutt. Uh, okay, so... We're going to take you to dinner. Go. Beat it. <laughs> Tacos. Tacos. So, and I actually had written down a note here talk, to talk about double blind when it came to turn sequence because I think that that's one way to allow for people to just move. And then when something is discovered, um, fog of war is lifted for one side or not the other, that a uh, referee could step in and say, hey, you you see these, they don't see, or whatever the case may be. And it's been a long time since I played a good double blind game. Um, okay. And that may be something that, that could be a fun <clears throat> That's jam, what I really like about double blind uh, jam. That's that for was, another day. Oh, my God, my brain's going. My brain is going. That's what I really like about, uh, um, damn it, Creechpiel. Yeah, we talked about that. I got to follow up on it. I got to play. I still haven't played it. Yeah, I have yet to play that either. So, what else do I have? So, we talk about um, turn turn sequence uh, yes. initiative. You know, I go, you go, alternating activation, like with chit pulls or with cards. Um, and I think I've mentioned this before that for me, the difference between a chit pull and a card, I think it's really designer preference if yeah, there's no difference a hex encounter game chit pool just seems natural probably for the publisher as well they just if they've got the space on a on the the cardboard they're going to throw in some chits you don't need yeah. to print cards if you got a card game print a few cards you don't need the chits they yeah unless you can tell me otherwise i don't Lock see them like function any different from each other they nope. don't function any differently. Um, it's just with lock and load with the World at War 85 series. Uh -huh. The original World at War was a chip pull, but th the they were pretty much standalone games. So when they printed out the 
uh, 49th Armored Division. They could have a chit that said 49th Armored Division, and all of the tokens of the 49th Armored Division would ha- say 49th Armored Division. Uh-huh. Well, with World War 85, they readjusted the thought process to be, okay, we're going to have a series of games. We want them to all be able to be intermixed and build on top of each other. So what they what they did then was color code the units. Uh-huh. So now I've got a blue company of or a, a blue battalion of uh, of M1s. I've got a green battalion of of uh, uh, T72s, and then the, instead of a chit that's got a a unit number on it. Uh-huh. They've got a card that color coded to uh-huh. so I now have the 11th ACR, uh-huh. 11th uh, Armored Cavalry Regiment as a card that's got a blue stripe on it that matches the blue stripe on those. The next game that comes out, wow, he's freezing up. My yeah, I've got a he froze up. Internet. <laughs> Am I better now? I- yeah, but but I think it yes, lock and or lock and so it's, it's the same card. process. They just they're using the cards to be able to expand the ability of how to use the counters in the game. Yeah, I think I mean if you if I was to to say what I think is better, um, and again I think the publishing aspect comes into it cost wise because again if you've got hex encounter and you've got cardboard is it's going to be cheaper. Um, but yeah. you can put more information on a card because you've got more landscape. If you need to. Right. Then, a, then a chit, even a one inch square chit, you can only put up so much information. Right. Right. But, and, and again, I, I think it's um, the, the idea of chit pull is kind of cool and it's just random card <clears> draw. Um, and I don't have a preference for either one. Um, it is a different feel. Yeah. And again, it might be a preference thing. You just like to pull chits as opposed to cards. So, yep. And we said it before, have fun with that. If, you know, do what yeah, you're like going to do. Both. What else? I had yeah. any other notes here. Oh, things like Overwatch, right? We were talking about interrupting. Um, so I'm going to say, I think, when it comes to a turn sequence, probably the easiest, flattest, flat meaning there's not a lot of levels, layers to it, um, not that it's not enjoyable, is probably something like what you did, Chris, with um, running silent. Both players are rolling dice at the exact same time, and the actual speed at which you can do it factors into your ability to win the game right that's some skill involved in how quickly you can roll your dice make the decisions to allocate those dice to what you're going to roll and what you're not going to roll and you're doing it completely independent of the other player until that other player whacks you with a uh, with a missile that you're now having to react to and so you have to but again it's all real time Um, and short of a video game i think that is probably as realistic of a simulation as you can get. So right. from that, you have Ocean Thunder, which is still very abstract. It's still very streamlined. <clears throat> Do you have any designs, either of you, that are maybe on the crunchy side when it comes to turn sequence? Not really. No? I, 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 again, I'm not a crunchy player. Um, I, I'm, I'm a results player. Okay. I, I want the game to be streamlined to be able to give me the, give me a historically viable conclusion. And I, you know, I don't care that, you know, Private Shablonsky is carrying the, uh, the M249 with, uh, you know, 150 rounds of 7.62. Right. 
um, or five, I'm sorry, five, five, six rounds with him. I, I don't care. I care that Private Shalonsky is part of a fire team and he is the saw gunner. So he is able to put out a little bit more firepower. So he's going to give a bonus to that fire team because he can put out a little bit more firepower. Gotcha. Yeah, now that makes sense to me as well. Now, there are people out there that want to know that he can fire at, you know, X number of bullets per second, blah, blah, blah. Again, if that's the way you game, great. Have fun. If I if you're my friend, I will sit down and play the game with you at least once. If I have fun with it, we'll play it again. If we're not gonna have fun, if I don't have fun with it, hey, yeah, thanks for putting the game on for me. I appreciated it. Hey, next time can we play, you know, one of my games? Gotcha. Because so, I'll play anything. Because I'm not here for the competition. I'm here for the social interaction. Yeah, I, that's 100% me. I tell people all the time, yeah. I don't play these games to win. It doesn't mean I don't try to play smart and I don't try to achieve whatever objectives there are. And if I win, great. But I very rarely will game a, a system if I'm not play testing, if I'm play testing, all rules are off. I'm going to try to break your game. I'm going to, I'm going to find those weird combos. I'm going to try to. But if the three of us are sitting around playing a game, having a drink, and just chit chatting, I really don't care. In fact, the better the story, if I do something dumb and it and we're laughing, having a good time, and it tells a story, jumping off wall. Yeah. Well, we did it in that game, right? It was like the chances of that. And I said, but, you know, I dumb and dumber. So you're telling me there's a chance. As long as I got a chance, I'm going yep. to do it. Yeah, exactly. Because if I pull it off, you're a hero. I'm not going to forget it, right? It yeah. makes that night. Yeah. You go, if, Remember if you that time your... when Hissy jumped off the wall? And even now we talk about it, even though I failed. So right. it's, it's perfect. Right. Because, it's, five, because, six is in a because it's a great story. Yeah. Even though he didn't pull it off. It was like, I you need know, to roll like a one on a 10 sided dice. And I rolled what, not a one. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> click, click. It just, click. Ah! For, for the me, boss is going to smash me. Yeah. For me, it's just about, about having a good time. Enjoying, uh, Enjoying the time with friends, you know. Um, Let me and, answer a couple and, of and things you, that real quick. Sorry, Chris, I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, Stuka Joe says, if a card saves me a trip to the rule book scenario book, I'll take cards over chits. There are many uses for cards besides the traditional use. Agree 100%. Um, that was a lesson I had learned playing Magic and then L5R. L5R I still think is one of the best war games ever made. Um, but it's a card-based game, and it, the strategy is so deep. And, again, the rules are delivered on a card. When you play it, you don't have to search, right? It's like, I'm going to – what am I going to do? I'm going to attack the rearmost unit with a plus two advantage. Boom. It's on the card. I don't enough. have to dig through the book. It tells me what I'm going to do, right? So, yeah, if I was to compare that over chits, you can use the cards for both chit selection yep. and adding some unique rule when you're activated. So you could literally make them better than chits. I was trying not to pick a camp, but I'm team card all day, all night. Um. Nerd says, crunchy game, 100-year war campaign <laughs> in real time. <laughs> uh, uh, that does not even sound fun. Here we go. Another is Chris, correct? Yeah, Chris Long. Chris Long, eh? Eh, yep. Uh, Chris, um, if, you're, if you're still listening, I would love to get a hold of your rules. Yes, that we talked about the other night. I, 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 
I think I have found my 15 millimeter uh, American uh, infantry, modern American infantry, and my uh, my 15 millimeter Hajis, and uh, I'm I'm ready to I'm ready to go with them. Yeah, in fact, if you I'm want to walk about, I think you're in our Discord. Um, we'd love to get a set of those rules. Maybe put some stuff on TTS Tabletop Simulator and uh, do a uh, the Play Testers is another podcast that I decided to do because I because I have time, I guess. <laughs> Why not? Um, where we play test games and love to get your game and play test it with some people if you're up for that. Just um, drop in the Discord. Like I said, if not, I'll put it in the show link, the show description, a link to our Discord, and you can let us know there. So Mike has a question on the card jam. Is there a limit to the rules length? No, there is not. Write, is, write a Bible if you need to. Well, okay, on, on the current? Uh, oh, yeah, on the card, on the card jam. jam. Not the postcard. Yeah, the postcard, oh, it's yeah. got to, I mean, unless you can do some on the card. micro fish <laughs> or something. I never said you couldn't. <laughs> yeah, but that requires... Why that not? requires special uh, equipment that not everybody has. Yeah, I know. I know. If I if I had enough space, I would like to write my rules all in um, binary, ones and zeros, and let you have to decipher it just to make it more difficult. Good Jesus. Yeah, um, nerd. And I, I agree with Stuka as well. The cards can make the game play much easier. Yes, and can. then Walkabout says... Uh, overbalance and too many complicated rules put put me off a bit. Yep, me too. Yeah, I, I, and I, I don't know if you heard it, Chris, but I was saying for me, balance, one of the, if a game is under a certain time frame, I don't even consider balance in my design unless it's just one side always wins. That's not, that's not a game. That's just an exercise in pain. Um but if one side wins by 50 points in a, and you've got 20, I don't care if it's a five-minute game. Hey, you took it on the chin, shuffle and play again. Oh, the bands, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Stuka says, the great thing about poker-sized cards is they funnel your vision directly on what you're looking for, and you don't waste time seeking for info like letter-sized player aids. That's a great point. I kind of was saying that, but not as succinct as, uh, as Stuka said there. Yeah, if you're looking through a rule book and you know on this page that rule is there or a reference to it and you're scanning and scanning, you got to read the whole page sometimes if you're if it's buried in there. But when it's on a card, you got a paragraph at most and that rule is going to be in there and you're going to be able as he says, funnel your vision directly to that rule. And again, in most games, the added beauty of a card is that card is going to, you're going to play that card when that rule applies for the most part. And it's, I love, as you can tell, I love cards. uh, Unashamedly, I love cards. And there's something about flipping a card that's just better than pulling a chit. Yeah, I think that's personal preference, but I'm going to agree 100% with you, nerd. There's something about cards that maybe because you play them as a kid, all different types of card games, and you make up card games. Like, <laughs> I make up card games. Um, and I didn't grow up pulling chits. I mean, I did some chit as a kid, but somebody had to say it. You already said one tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I said, at least we, I agree with you, boss. I agree with you. <laughs> You hosers. Beer? Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll take one. So I will definitely take one. The the last thing that uh, Walkabout says there, and, I, and I'll give you a perfect example. This here gives you essentially everything you need to play the game. We're talking about fistful of lead. It, yeah, oh. in, in this in this in this situation, fistful of lead, a a, a good concise. Uh, well, QRL. let me let me point out how keep that keep that for reference. Um, what Stuka was saying, 
when you, and I highly recommend this, if you buy any products from Wiley Games for the Fistful of Lead, get their cards. You don't need them. You can play with a standard deck, but I'm going to tell you why, and it's exactly what Stuka said and what I was talking about. You've got that one page. I'm sure it says what a seven of hearts does or an ace does. But you still got to yep. look at that. You still got to find it. It's still going to take time. On the card, what does that say? Boom, reload. You don't have to go to that player's aid. Find out what a six is the reload. So exactly what we've been cool. talking about, cards are – and again, the, the show is supposed to be about turn sequence, and we're closing in on two hours. So we're going to go a little over because I still want to talk about um, my mechanics. And besides, they they the, the cards are really great looking. Oh, they are. And they, they really, since they are themed, like this is the Battlesuit Alpha set for you know big stompy robots. Yep. It it keeps you in that. Well, it's like painting miniatures, right? It yeah. gives you the feel of uh, that you're you're doing something with that theme. So before we close the shop on this topic, because I still want to go over a mechanic that I like that I and we'll spend uh, 20, 30 minutes on that uh, or whatever. Is there anything else you guys wanted to add when it comes to turn sequence? I think we kind of scratched the surface. I think there's a little more we can get into. So obviously in another another segment we can do another show we can get dive into more specifics on various games and the, and how different turn structures are set up um, but at least for this week or this episode any final thoughts just um, you know whatever you do decide however you do decide to uh, make your game sequence work make sure that you're not leaving somebody Board. You know, yeah. you're, you're not, you're not, you're not, if you do decide to go, I go, you go, allow for some kind of interruption just to keep the other player engaged. Yeah, I think there's some areas with the I go, you go um, where. I would, I would almost like to see a game, and when I say that, that means something that I might want to have to design now, where when it's my turn to move, it's your turn to shoot. So as I'm moving, you're shooting. As you're moving, I'm shooting. So we're both doing something, just different action sequence at the same time. Does that make sense? So the only time I can shoot yeah. is during your movement phase. Mm. Let me build if it. We, if, if we did it right, it could work. Well, but it's there, there's a fine line between. Right. <laughs> and again, there, you know, sometimes novelty isn't bad, and sometimes novelty for novelty's sake is just crap. Well, there's some logic behind it. If we're both hiding behind a wall, and nobody's shooting at each and anybody. Right, and there are things where you can shoot, you know, cover fire and move, and that would could be implemented into that to that mechanic as well. And um, I'm not designing a system here tonight, but I think at some point, at least for a miniature game, or let me rephrase that, for a tactical game, because there's many tactical games that can be played with or without minis. You can play them with cardboard. You can play them with wooden blocks. Um, that's not a limiting factor uh, in my book. I mean, obviously, there's different ways you can represent information, uh, as we talked about with cards. So I won't go down that rabbit hole. But I would love to see something where you've got, um, you're moving, I'm firing, or you're firing, I'm moving with some modifications. Um, so yeah. with that in mind, uh, like I said, we'll, we're going to move on to, I want to start adding a couple of segments regular segments to the podcast. And so the first one that I thought of, and I would love to get some feedback from you guys. Uh, and we talk about a number of different things about talking about head. Some, I'm sorry? I swear to God, if you say Sweet 16, I'm going to punch you in the head. 
I wasn't going to, but now you've challenged me. <laughs> <laughs> no, so I, I want to talk about mechanics from other games. I'm kind of calling it, I like it, things that we like about other designs. And it could be multiple things, but I'm going to just pick one out. And, and something that really made me stop and think, wow, that's a cool idea. I never thought of that. I like the way that that's abstracted. And that is the way that Lock and Load with their game Point Blank handles terrain. And a couple of things about that. They give you a map, a mat that has sections. And you don't need it to play. You can play the game without it because you use, and I've got some of the cards here, and they're cards, and these are terrain cards, and they look something. Let me blow myself up here to share this. Okay. So this is an example of a card. It's a marsh. It's got a, units may not refuse, and I'll talk about that in a second. It's got an eye that's half opened or half closed. I don't know which camp you're from. And it's got a modifier that deals with, I believe, your defense. Okay. And what you do is these come into play. So, for example, here's a stone wall. Okay. It's also got the eye. And something like smoke has a closed eye. Now, the, the eyes are for line of sight. Now, I'm not a fan of how they actually count for line of sight. I won't get into the specifics. Um, I think it's a little contrived, but the idea that the terrain half, this is partially obscured, and that has a, an effect on your dice roll, to completely obscured, meaning you can't shoot through it. And if you've got two terrain like that, that adds up to a closed eye, okay? Pretty simple stuff. Two closed eyes, like two half closed eyes equal a closed eye. You can't shoot through it. That's not what I found really cool about this system when it comes to terrain. And again, what that, what it does is, you have the ability with some of your characters to do recon. Recon allows you, and I'm going to oversimplify the rules so not to get bogged down into it too much. You can draw a terrain card into your hand. And that terrain card can be played at various points during the game, either for or for you, as it's, you're going to be moving into a section of the, the map and you put down a terrain card, and that represents the terrain that you're in. You either draw them randomly, or you play them from your hand. I can also play a terrain card, because the way movement works in point blank is, you, you decide on, say, turn one, you're going to move a unit. You put a marker on them that points your direction that you're going to move. You don't actually move until the beginning of your next turn. So your opponent has an opportunity to do things before you actually move. One of them being place a terrain card in this location that you're going. So you may have in your hand an advantageous terrain card for you, and I may have one that gives me an advantage and you a disadvantage, and I can play that terrain card knowing that you're going to be moving in what direction you're moving. And I can put a terrain card prior to you moving into it. Now, you can back out of it, and there's some rules for that. But I'm not going to get into those rules so much as just the concept of you have an area on the game board that you can either randomly or selectively place terrain, and it can change. And conceptually, and I got this right away. I know some people might struggle with this concept and it was just one that resonated with me is let's say i'm sitting in a section of the map and i've got some cover i'm i'm in the some woods 
Well, that whole area is not woods. There's multiple types of terrain in that particular area of the map. And so depending on my opponent, they could play a different terrain card, change the terrain I'm in, or I can change the terrain I'm in to basically say that I'm moving within that area from the, the forest to behind a stone wall to maybe in the clearing onto a road or through Bob wire. And what I like about that is it adds, now it takes you out of, it's a tactical game and it now comes into a game of using the terrain, which you can abstract in your head as you're out in the, in a battle and how do you best use the terrain that's in front of you to deploy your, your forces and try to achieve your objectives. And so I really like how they've taken these terrain cards, dealt with the line of sight and a little bit of fog of war when it comes to the terrain. And you think you get into cover behind a building but abstractly, I play a card that now has you in the open. You may not have moved. You may still be hiding behind that wall, but I've now moved to where I'm flanking you, even though it's not called flanking. And again, you have to kind of just accept a little bit of the concept of finding these clear shots, even in a, when they were behind trees or behind a tank or behind a wall. And that terrain changes on you. <coughs> Excuse me. Have you guys, either of you, I know, Chris, I think you have Point Blank, don't you? I have it. I have not yet played it. Okay. Um, what do you know about it, Eric? Anything? He just says he knows about it. Now, I didn't, um, you're muted, by the way, boss. I didn't give these guys a heads up as to what game and what mechanic I was going to <laughs> talk about tonight. So uh, next week we'll be a little more informed. Uh, at least I'll share my thoughts uh, or whatever thoughts they might have um, for what we can talk about. But for me, it was one of these things that was like, oh, my God, that's such a cool idea that the terrain becomes dynamic mm -hmm. and I can change it and maybe it, where I think I was in a good spot, I'm no longer in a good spot. Um, yeah, it sounded interesting. I don't, I, I got to delve into it a little bit. I haven't, I know about it, but I haven't, uh, let will see if Stuka Joe has a video on it. Oh yeah, he's, well, if Stuka Joe's covered it, it's going to be a good video. He does well. Yeah. He does amazing stuff. I mean, I think you're all of us know that. Um, I'll get caught up with some of these uh, comments. Right. I'm sorry, guys. Reactions during movements, okay. Do they come in dual lands? Okay, that's funny based on our conversation about Magic the Gathering. Um, yes and no. Um, and the reason I say that is there are some cards that are permanent and uh, I guess that's not dual, but I will say that I had, um, I had done a video where I took their map and I cut the map into pieces and then mounted them on cardboard. And I made basically um, tiles, map, mat tiles. Cause it's not really a map per se. Mm -hmm. And they did talk about, um, their lock and load is going to print those so that you can get tiles. I, I don't think it was me who, who made that happen. Yeah. I think they had thought about it and weren't sure. And then you know, I do a video and there's a little more talk about it. And I think they, that may have influenced them to some degree to say, Hey, you know what? That is a good idea. Why don't we, why don't we go ahead and do this? Um, I don't, I'm not going to take any credit for it. But I had was playing on Tabletop Simulator, and I was talking to them because I had actually made some of my own tiles that represent beach. And the designer of the game, oh, my God. Let me get his name real quick. Sorry. I don't have it referenced in front of me. Sean. I was playing with Sean and um, Devin, and... 
was talking about, I had some things that I, you know, I was asking him if I, if I was to do a scenario book and a few other things, would they be okay with it? And because what I wanted to do was represent the beach because there's no beach um, terrain. And they're right. going to be expanding this game to all sorts of different fronts and this terrain is going to change. So I'm sure it's going mm -hmm. to come. Um, but I was looking at actually taking the map and making big tiles also have some game effect that you could double up with, say, a localized terrain card. Now, that's not in the design. I'm not saying it's going to be in the design. That might be a homebrew that I do when I do my Normandy because moving on the beach, you're not going to change that, that out for a swamp. It just doesn't make sense. Right. You're right. coming up a beach. That whole area is going to be a beach, and it is a little harder to run on. And so I'm going to make a game, uh, a house rule when I design those particular map type <clears throat> that they have a movement hindrance built into them. So in that sense, yeah, they will have two card effects. Um, now, like I said with this one with the marsh, it says units may not uh, may not be refused. So you do have the ability in the game to refuse. So if, if you decide you want to move a unit into an area, and I play a terrain card, you can refuse that terrain card. Now, what that means in gameplay is when you're supposed to move into that terrain, you just don't. You have the option to not move into there. Now, you're, you're still considered moving, and this is, again, I haven't played it enough to really get this correct and, and have an opinion on whether I like it or not. Um, but what it will do is if I play a terrain that you don't like, it will slow up your plans or force you to do something less than optimal. Okay. Um, and I, I, again, I like that because at some point, if you've, and again, I don't know the rules well enough to say that if you play a card, what can I do to get rid of that card? Uh, and I believe there are mechanics in the, in the game for that as well. Any questions guys that, about what I've been rambling on? on the <laughs> oh, oh, good. Yeah, I don't, I don't know this game enough, unfortunately, so I can't ask better questions. Oh, fair enough. Fair it's enough. clear as mud. Okay. In the chat, <laughs> other than tell Mike is asking if they come in dual lands. I'm just, I'm just looking. I don't think they do, but I'm just taking a quick look. I think if they did, they'd have dual effects, like... Some of them have up well. So you've got whether the what the defense is, what the line of sight is, and whether or not it can be refused or not. Meaning, if it can't be refused, you're forced to move into it. So, dual effects, yes. If you want to call that dual lands, then I would say yes, Ptolemaeus. I can't. I thought he was talking about lancing duels, and it was between two knights. <laughs> well, Panzer again. Which is a completely Panzer. different game. Didn't you win uh, in a con? Yeah, well, I did and then didn't. Okay, explain that. Um, I, I I beat all the other uh, uh, all the other uh, um, entrance. Yeah, but got my ass handed to me by. The uh, the designer of the game and his Billy Badass uh... <laughs> thing is you won until you played the ringer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I won until... Uh, yeah. It was, here's your ass. Put it on as a hat. <laughs> <laughs> So Ptolemy Kiss asks, well, something like walking in a stream, then hitting a sinkhole. Yes. That would just be a sinkhole. No. Unless you're applying the effects in different phases of the game, I don't see how it wouldn't be anything but a sinkhole. Because you're, you're walking along. Let's say you're walking in a river. And you... Are about you not walking the same river twice. 
What's that? You can't stand in the same river twice. Sure you can. You've never gone fly fishing, have you? It's different water. It's a different river. It's constantly changing. No. The water changes. The river does not. The water is the river. No, it's not. <laughs> Geophysically, no, it is not. Okay. The bed of the, the the bed of the river is the river. The water is the conveyance of which flows through it. <laughs> okay, so you were saying, and I interrupted you. My bad, boss. Sorry. About oh yeah, so you're walking along a river. You're about knee deep, and then all all of a sudden you drop up to your chest because you've hit a deeper part of the river that you didn't know about. Yeah. But for so, gameplay yeah. purposes, that I don't think comes into play. Now, one, another thing that I didn't mention is when it comes to movement, you can, I think here's how you can change the terrain in the card you're, or the, the area that you're at on the map is you can move within that area. So you say, I'm going to move. You spend all the, the action points and whatnot, the cost involved in moving, and you just change your terrain card. So in effect, you're moving within that area of the map. Which again, I think it's a, for me, it was one of these, I mean, we all have it, right? We're designing a game or we play a game and we go, oh my God, I never thought to do that. Why, did, why didn't I think of that? And this was a why didn't I think of that moment where I'm like, oh, how can I use that? And so when we were playtesting um, Richard's Toot Toot, which, by the way, is going to be a, oh, my God, that's even the one turn we got in was super fun. Um, but that was where I was taking the concept of the terrain that you see here in um, Point Blank and trying to explain it to him as something to uh, consider putting into Toot Toot. That's even a fun name to say. I'm going to go play some Toot Toot. Yeah. <laughs> Break out your Toot Toot. What would, and then if he comes up with a second version, it'd be Toot Toot Two. <laughs> oh, one and a half. <laughs> no, it's got to be two. It's got to be Toot Toot Two. Yeah, we got to convince him to do that. Or oh, two, two, reloaded. <laughs> reloaded. There we go. <laughs> All righty, guys. So we're, I, like I said, I've been trying to <laughs> beep, beep. Okay. <laughs> okay. So see, Mike's on my team. No man ever steps in the same river twice. Here we go. For it's not the same river and he is not the same man. Boom. Booyah. Yeah. Mike Twain. <laughs> hey, Team Mike is down with the towel. <laughs> right, baby. <laughs> All righty, guys. I want to thank Chris and um, Eric for being on the show as always. I think tonight was a pretty engaging conversation. Um, ending with the uh, no man ever steps in the same river twice. That's a good way to be out. Um, Saturday morning, 10 o'clock, we're going to be play testing Richthofen. Get on Discord, get a link, join. You guys can play. Um, right now, it's going to be me and Eric, but if somebody else shows up, I will watch. And um, that's Saturday, 10 o'clock Pacific time. And until next week on this show, and I'll tell you when we got an up, uh, I'll get an update. Hopefully, if we don't have a, a guest next week, I, I've got a couple iffies. I don't want to say anything until I tie it down. Uh, but if not, I'll see you guys next week. Thanks again. All right. Thank you.